Good morning and aloha. Aloha. Welcome to our morning worship service. My name is Pat Pedro and I will be assisting our pastor, Mandela, in this morning's worship service. Do we have any visitors today? We'll now have our gathering music by Edwin Moore. Spirit of courage, 
is filled with fear in our hearts. Spirit of fire, inflame us with the presence of God. Spirit of peace, help us be still and listen to God's word. Spirit of love, inspire us to proclaim the good news. Spirit of love, help us to open ourselves to the needs of others. Spirit of power and truth, guide us all the way of Christ. Come into our hearts, make us a new creation. <clears throat> the prayer of confession in unison. God, confront us in this time of peace. Confront us with the fears and hopes that can tell you and forgive us for the sins of the Holy Spirit. Confront us with our closeness. Forgive us for leaning into our own understanding of God and living by our own heart. Knock it all along the doors of our hearts. Do not let us trust until we have gained entrance into every part of our world. <laughs> Forgive us for our indifference to your presence and love. Through your grace, we come before the altar of forgiveness. May we receive the truth of Christ and our mercy. And grace today, I know that we are forgiven and we rise in the mercy of God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the cross and the love we have for the Lord in our hearts this morning. Share with me as we proclaim this good news from the Gospel of Matthew, beginning with the word in all together. In Matthew 17, 20, Jesus says, For assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Good morning. God is the God who moves mountains, who wants miracles, and He's way he's much more than that. He's a way maker. So let's join in our praise songs and we sing on these and God's characteristics and the God who is so rich He deserves our blessings and our songs. So let's join in the songs that we sing the way maker. Thank you. 
In this quiet moment, we lay aside our ableness, our ability, our control, and we come to the altar of the Almighty, who is more than able, who can solve things in ways that we can't even think or imagine this morning. So let's go to God in prayer. Dear God, as we come before your holy mountain this morning, we offer to you those things which are on our hearts, whether spoken or unspoken, and we lift at the other stand to you. We lift all people there, God. We lift those still longing to get out. We lift those in harm's way. We lift our military. We lift those who are in control there and those who are not, that you will soften their hearts with your words of justice and mercy. We lift Pastor David. We lift him, a friend of Rosemary's, for healing. Dear God, we lift Alan Basilio for healing of the body for good health and, and for strength, Lord. And the prayers for service members in Kabul and those families who have lost loved ones. We offer thanksgiving for all that you have done, God, and all that we trust you are doing, that which we can't see and that which we can see, God. Help us to remember, God, that you are with us. Each one of us here, and you're with the leaders on our island, the leaders of our nation. That the circumstances in our world, whether across our dinner table or across the globe, they don't change your influence in your power, your almighty power, your eternal power, God. Help us to remember that. You have prepared us for any change or challenges that we might face, God. That you are teaching us in the, in the midst of even chaos in our lives. That you are, that we are your disciples, even in the midst of things that we don't understand and circumstances we would not choose. God, whether it's a fear of the unknown or an all too visible mountain of work, numerous army that we're facing. Remind us in this moment and in all moments that you are able, abundantly able, and in control. That each of us can be certain of your presence and your power because of what you have done in the past. Dear God, help each one of us throughout this week to look back through our, our history with you. To be reminded every second of how you have intervened over and over in our lives and you have brought us through and you have not just moved mountains, you have conquered them, you have fallen into the sea. Teach us again the, the power of your ableness, God, when it comes to those armies metaphorically in our life that, that subtract from our happiness, that, that cause us to focus on our problem instead of your power of God. Help us to remember that while our circumstances may change, you are God. You are the Alpha and the Omega. Yesterday, presently, and eternally, God. Help us to remember that there is nothing we are called to do apart from your power and your love. Absolutely nothing. That in you we are more than conquerors because you are our defender and our protector and our nothingness, God. We ask for your love to hover over our globe, for your mercy to infiltrate and besiege every country, that your movement of love begun by your Son, Jesus Christ, will invade all borders, God. Across our dinner tables, across our streets, throughout our neighborhoods, across our island, across the seas, from nation to nation, country to country, village to village, and city to city, God. Reintroduce yourself to our world. 
reintroduce your unconditional love and your call to us to be unified. That we are better together, and that we are better together in your love and your mercy, God. For the prayers that we've spoken names for, and for those that are still within our hearts and souls that we lift up to you in this quietness, even as I pray and speak aloud, God. We know and we trust and we believe that we give them into your able, almighty hands. And that though we may not always be able to see the way that you are making a way, even when we can't see it, there you are, removing all that would cause us to stumble, removing all that which would harm us, removing all of that which takes away from your glory. But God, thank you for leading us in our lives. Thank you for being both a mountain mover and the lover of our souls. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Great multitude, 
but the battle is not yours, but God's. This is the word of God. The New Testament is from Romans chapter 8, verse 37. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors for him who loves us. This is the good news. Let us pray. Dear God, we, we ask for your blessing upon this time together that you will bring this scripture text and this story alive within each one of us that each of us as we need to hear it and interpret it, that you will give us individually and personally the specific word that, that you would have for us today as we join together to praise your name, to pray, and to celebrate what you have done in the story of your love and your people. A story that began so long ago and continues today in your forever and eternity. Thank you, God, that we are part of your living love story. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you have problems with your car, you would go to a, well, first you would, I would cry a little hard, but anyway, you would go to someone who repairs cars. And if your washing machine was falling apart, you would find someone who knew how to fix washing machines that are falling apart. Or if you're a lady, a resort gentleman, you had a piece of jewelry that was falling apart, you might find a jeweler to put that back together. If, um, if you're a student at school and your grades were falling apart and everything was falling out of your notebook and your life was falling apart at school, then you would probably go seek out a tutor to help you with that. Sometimes, though, I wonder if we live in a world where there are many who don't know, and some of us who forget, who, who we often forget, who we go to if our lives are falling apart, if our world seems to be falling apart. And it's, it's interesting in the Bible that um, God does so many amazing things, but this is just one of the things that I love, the, God in, in, in this love story that is the Bible takes these moments and these seasons in people's lives, not just kings like we're going to talk about today, but ordinary people like you and I of all different ages, even children. And then often God, when there's, when there's a, a crisis, God steps in and God reintroduces God's self in a brand new way. Or, or God steps in and, and helps the people see God in a different light within that crisis. God uses those crises, not just in the ancient days, but now. And in our story today, this king, Joseph, has, has just gotten news that this army, and it says vast, army is approaching and, and they don't have the manpower to deal with this army. King Jehoshaphat is in a crisis. You know, you, you know you're in a crisis when, when as a human you can't fix the problems. The story talks about a vast army and so we could have a vast army of problems. Use that metaphorically. You could have all kinds of problems that seem like a vast army approaching on you. I also wanted to use the metaphor of a mountain though this morning because the mountains are right here at our church. And I want you to imagine this king. So he's got this vast army approaching. But also think of it as those mountains out there. And think of them as us sitting here or King Jehoshaphat sitting here and those mountains literally moving towards us. And there's nothing we can do to stop them. And they move closer and closer. And as they're moving, we hear them creaking and groaning with their power. And we could go out there and try to hold them back, but that is beyond our ability to do that. Closer and closer they come, and we know that if they reach this place, they will crush us. Think of those mountains. If that really happened, they would crush us. And that's the crisis that this king 
and Judah finds itself in. There's this incredible, vast army heading towards them that will crush them. Just like if those mountains move in on us, they will crush us. And it, it's like God uses these moments to reintroduce God's self in a new way. If you think of the word revival, it's like God stirs things within that crisis to revive the hearts of the people. And still does that today. And by revival or revive, I mean, think about, go back to the car. If your car's falling apart or your car won't start, one of the first things that you might do is get those battery things that you hook from one car to another. And sometimes when the battery is completely died and you do that, you use those battery cables, oh, your car comes back to life. So it's like God takes these crises, not just in Old Testament times, and not just in the New Testament, but even today, and it's like that in our lives, and in our church life. We think about in the emergency room, think about the doctors there, and how there are moments when it looks like it's all over. There's no heartbeat. It looks like the story has been written. And they take those paddles and they put them on that person's chest. And after once or twice or three times, however many times they do it in that moment with that particular person, the heart starts again. So that's how God uses these crises. It's almost like putting those paddles on the, on the heart of the people, the nation of Israel, this nation of Judah, to bring them not just back to life, but to see God in a great new way. You know, we can come to church and sing songs and read the Bible. And it can all be nice and fluffy here. But that's just one way. But when everything's falling apart, things look a lot different. You might not be hearing that song way back here. And you might not be seeing smiles. And you might not be sitting here just oozing with God's goodness. And God uses these crises, just like the one we're going to talk about today, to be real, to have a personal encounter with the people, and to be made real in their lives. So here we have this king. Now, crises can come in so many different ways. They did then, and they do now. This king, King Jehoshaphat, has this army of, of problems coming towards him. But we can have all kinds of crises in our lives, too. We can have an army of problems coming to us when it comes to our finances. We can have a mountain of debt, amen, where rocks seem to get thrown off that mountain and plunk us in the head every single day. We can have an army of health things coming at us where it's like they just sneak up on us. They're just stealthy, and they're just waiting for the next moment to get a hold of us. That's what it can feel like. We can have an army or a mountain of problems in relationships. To where it feels like we've done everything to pray to God to make that mountain move from advancing. Where it can feel like we've done everything possible that we can think of to stop that army of regret and that army of blame and that army of judgment and that army of disappointment from advancing on us. We can have an occupational crisis where we don't know what's going to happen at work and an army of worry advances on us. Or maybe you just retired and you don't know what's going to come next. You just have a mountain of fears about who are you now and what is your identity. Or maybe at one point in time you felt called to the particular job you're at, but not so much. Or maybe you're just in high school for the love of you. You can't even figure out what you would want to do in life. At any age in life, we can have a mountain of worries or an army of concern about our jobs and our occupation. There's no ending categories of where we can have a crisis in our lives. And in this story, this king has a liberal army advancing on him. And so, the first thing he does is he seeks the Lord. So when we've got a crisis that's developing something we can't fix of our own power, 
Even before that, and in all things, we should be seeking the Lord. Amen? The first thing that he does is he seeks the Lord. And he doesn't just seek the Lord by himself. He calls the entire nation. He calls them to fast and to come together to seek the Lord with them. And this is such an amazing part of the story. I just think it's such good news. And so he begins to speak to God because prayer is just talking to God. It's conversation with God. And in the prayer, he says, he's telling God that they're outnumbered, that they don't have the ability to fight these armies coming towards them. And he says these words, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Say that with me, one, two, three. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Now this is good news, because that means we don't have to have all the answers all the time. That means there are gonna be moments in our journey with God that we're not going to know what to do. Even as we seek the Lord, we're not going to know what to do. That's why we're seeking the Lord in the first place, amen. But then the text tells us exactly what to do next. Where do we put our eyes? On you. Where do we put our eyes? On God. Where do we put our eyes? On our great defender. So the king says, we don't know what to do, but we put our eyes on you. Now you all, that means that when that army of financial soldiers seems to keep coming at us, and that mountain of death seems to have its own voice and speak to us, and that stack of bills on the table doesn't look like a stack anymore, it looks like a mountain, that means that we can say to our financial crises, you may be right there, but I'm putting my eyes on God. That means that we can say to any kind of health crises that comes our way. It may look like an army advancing on us or a mountain standing in our way of getting healthy again. We can say, oh, that may be so, but I am seeking God. I am putting my eyes on God. I don't know what to do about it yet, but I'm putting my eyes on God. And you may be experiencing whether it's in a romantic relationship, a friendship, a family relationship, something that's falling apart. And if you haven't done that yet, you will at some moment in time. Something that needs tending, something that needs healing. It's, it's not going the way that you dreamed or the way that you want it to. You may be dealing with that. And this means that it's okay if right now you're standing there and you're trying to figure it out and you don't know what to do. But you can look at that army, that mountain, of that relationship seeming to crumble, and you can say, I don't know what to do, but I'm going to put my eyes on God. Or maybe you're thinking about what comes next with an occupation. Maybe you're praying for someone that has those kinds of things going on, and you can say, I don't know how to help them, I don't know what to tell them to do, but oh God, I put my eyes on you regarding this. There's a lot of power in that verse. There is so much power in what can happen. The power that is unleashed when we seek the Lord. And even in a moment when we don't know what to do, we put our eyes on God. I don't know what to do, but I put my eyes on you. I don't know what to do, but I put my eyes on you. You know, I was thinking this morning and praying over today, and I thought, so, why do we have to say that in the beginning? Like, why do we have to have these crises and everything? Well, the easy answer is the Bible doesn't promise that a Christian walk is going to be without trials. But I, I was thinking about it. Looking back at what I had planned and prepared, I was thinking about it. Those mountains out there that could move and advance in on us, the feeling that that would have been for the king. And I thought about how 
God really can look different to us, the presence of God on a Sunday morning where we see the banners and we see the cross and all. There's so many reminders of God right here today. Now put us in a moment where everything's falling apart and we don't have all the answers and it's way beyond our ability and you're not sitting in church and you're not seeing the stained glass windows and the banners and the altar up there and the communion table here and these faces and these memories that you have up here. Let that situation get worse and worse. And God can look very different in our crises than on a Sunday morning. So let me give you an example of that. And why our crises, how God would use them. So think about when the disciples were on the boat. We talked about that together only a few weeks ago. And there was a storm. Jesus was up on the mountain praying. They had just fed over 5,000 people. And Jesus comes to them walking on the water. The disciples have been traveling with him for some time. They know what the creator of the world looks like. They know what Jesus Christ the Messiah looks like, even if they don't understand the true realm of who he is. They know. They have walked by him every day. Yet, when he comes walking to them on the water, they think that he's a ghost. They don't recognize him. But they're in the midst of a crisis. They're in the midst of this incredible storm where the wind and the gales are rocking the boat to the fact that they fear for their lives. It's not until Jesus says something that they know who he is. When we go through crises, and just like the king and his, the region of Judea is going through Judah, we learn to recognize what God will look like in our own personal processes or crises. And not only that, we learn to listen for God's voice, which may sound different to us in the crises than it does normally, or may sound exactly the same. We see God and we experience God and we discover God, we hear God, we look for God, in the midst of our crises, in a very different way than we do on a Sunday morning when we're sitting in here, and life seems relatively comfortable, at least for the time that we're in here. Think about, in the Gospel of John, it's after the crucifixion, it's Sunday morning, and she goes there to the tomb. Jesus isn't there. She looks around, and she sees a man. She's in the midst of the deepest grief we could imagine. You know that kind of grief. And Jesus is there, and she doesn't recognize him in the midst of her grief of her crisis. She thinks he's the gardener, and she thinks that until he calls her name. And then she knows who he is. Our crises, when we're going through difficult times in life, they help us. They help us learn to hear God calling our name. They sharpen our spiritual ears. We listen in a different way. And God speaks to us. In those moments when everything that's falling apart is way beyond anything that we can handle or that we can solve or take care of. Jehoshaphat. He's drawn the entire nation together. And it even says children. I don't know if you noticed that. It's every single age. They're all there, and they're praying. It says, seeking the Lord, and they're fasting. All of their attention is on God. I mean, that tells me a lot. If I've got a crisis going on, if I feel like those mountains are moving in and they're going to crush me, or I feel like there's an army of problems coming for me, I'm telling you, I think after this story, I, I'm just going to immediately fall to my knees and seek the Lord because look at the power of it. So he's called them all together. And if you sum up what he says in two words at the beginning of the prayer, it would be heaven rules, R-U-L-E-S, heaven rules. Turn to someone and say heaven rules. Now turn to someone different. You might have to move your head and say to someone different, heaven rules. Now imagine if in the middle of our crises, 
when everything seems to be falling apart or going wrong, if we begin our prayers with heaven rules. That puts everything in order, doesn't it? That's a reminder that our circumstances haven't changed God. That's a reminder that the one who still holds all the power and the might is God. Imagine that. Every prayer beginning with heaven rules. It's a reminder and it's a declaration that today is not the end of the story. It's a declaration that whatever army is coming for you, whatever those problems are, that's not the end of your story. And they won't have the final answer, nor the final power, because only heaven does. It's a reminder that whatever mountain is standing in front of you or advancing on you to crush you, that that mountain has no power that is not God-given. That God still holds all the power. All of heaven's resources are at God's, disposal, at God's disposal. Heaven rules. And then, this is what he does next. It's like, it's like he has this um, scrapbook or this picture book. So I got one today because my husband and I just had an anniversary. And it's like, before all of those people, he opens it. Not literally, but in his mind. And it's like, he begins to recount. He begins to recount all that God has done in their lives as a nation, as a people of God, as individuals. You know, it's kind of like if you look through your scrapbook. Now, this scrapbook is in his mind. I'm holding one here. But it's like, you know how you look through your scrapbook, you go, oh, I remember that moment. That was like one of the best times at times in our life. Since mine is one about as a marriage one, it's like, oh, I look at that picture and I remember why I fell in love with my husband. And I turn a page and I keep going and I and I remember all that we've shared together. And that's what the king begins to do. Only he says it out loud to the people. And he remembers and he remembers that. They are the generation, the ancestors of Abraham. Just like as you all gather here, he remembers, he reminds them in his prayer as he's talking to God that this is not just about the ones who are gathered here. It's your great grandparents and your grandparents and your parents. And as you all and your children and their children, this God has been around forever and present in every generation represented here and in our story. He reminds them that, that, that inside of God's hand is all of the power. That even though they're not able, God is still able. That there, there is nothing that can get between them, my famine or trial or judgment, get between them and God. He reminds this real of their history with God. I wonder if in his mind he doesn't speak of it. I wonder if he remembers how God was there to, to be there when Moses lifted his rod to part the Red Sea. Or at the Jordan River as Joshua and the Israelites are right there. How God was in it when they moved into that promised land and it removed the inhabitants and how God made good on God's promises and gave them the land to inhabit that God had promised. He recounts all of the good, all of the ways that God has been there in both the crises and in the victories. So I want you to think of the power in that. Whether you're in a crisis or the next time you have a crisis or a problem. The power that comes in seeking the Lord. The power that comes in saying, I don't know what to do, but I'm going to put my eyes on you, God. The power that comes in, giving that to God and then recounting your own mental scrapbook of all that God has already done in your life. The ways God has intervened and saved you already. All the times that you may have said, I don't know what to do. Now you know the next step. But I put my eyes on you. And because they did all this, you know how I pray each Sunday that God will give each of us a specific word? Because they have sought the Lord, and because they have done this with their king, 
There is a specific word that comes to someone in that group. And to Zechariah's son comes the word that they don't need to be discouraged because the battle is not theirs. The battle is the Lord's. And my friends, that's not just a, a word for an ancient time long ago. That's the word for right now. The battle is not ours. The battle is the Lord's. We're called to seek the Lord in all things. Chaos or victory. We're called to look to the Lord for ableness when those mountains advance on us or encroach on our lives or when those armies of troubles come at us. We're called to look at the one who is our defender. Turn to someone and say, God is my defender. Some of y'all need to look, look a lot more sure about saying that than you do it. So I want you to say it with some confidence this time. Turn to someone else and say, God is my defender. The story doesn't use that word, but if you take it all and you sum it up, God is our true defender. When you don't know what to do, put your eyes on God. Big or small, put your eyes on God. Seek the Lord, and then listen. When things are beyond your ableness, seek the Lord. When the mountains advance towards you, when the army is coming at you, the army of death, the army of a relational breakdown, the army of depression, the army of hopelessness, the army of disappointment, the army of fatigue, the army of ill health, when it comes for you, you may not know what to do in that moment. You may not have something to solve it, and the doctor may not have it, or all your Christian friends that you talk to, but you can put your eyes on God the great defender, because the battle is not yours, the battle is the Lord's. Let us pray. Your God, it's in your presence that we do hear the rocks falling. As you take away the mountains in our lives, Mountains that we can't get over or around or through or that his hands upon us. It is in your presence that we realize that those armies of whatever kind of problems that we might have, even if it's simply the army of fear, it's in your presence, God, that we remember for the power truly is, that it's in your hands as the king in our story says, that all power and honor and glory are yours, God. So in those moments, God, when we don't know what to do next, help us, God, to remember to seek you. And when we don't know what to do, to put our eyes on you, to listen. God, help us in the midst of crises to not ask, why is this happening to me, but to ask, God, what do you want me to learn from this? What are you teaching me? Help us, God, to begin to recognize you in the midst of crises. For instance, this pandemic, it seems it's like it's never going to end, God. Help us to recognize you there. Help us to hear you there. For the incredible disaster in Afghanistan, God. For other places across the globe where things seem to be falling apart in so many ways, God, and for so many people. Help us to see you there, God. Help us to hear you there. In our personal lives, God. Whatever each person here is going through or will be going through or has been through, God. Help them to see you fresh and myself as well, God, with, with new eyes. New eyes that look for you the way that Peter did on the water. New eyes that look for you the way that Mary did in the garden. New eyes that look for you in the way that the king and, and Judah looked for you on that day as they gathered together and sought you. And there we will find you, God. Thank you for being ever present, always revealing yourself in new ways to us, God, through your power and your mercy. 
Thank you, God, for being our true defender. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Dear God, thank you for these gifts that you have given to us, also undeserved. We give them back to you now, to be used for your glory on our island and in our world. That it will reach those who need it the most, and those who need to know your unconditional love. In Jesus' name, we offer these gifts. Amen. announcement, September is a giveaway campaign, and you can go to your favorite food line, South and say, or food line forms, and tell them you want to make a donation, and our code is 77126, and you may donate up to $249 per person for our organization. Um, we also have a donation of clothing, scarves, shoes, and jewelry, memory, and flower bread. Uh, these will be sorted and displayed for individuals interested in obtaining any of the items, uh, which will be minimum in place. Uh, so calendar of events, and we have our Bible study group, gathering and celebration, remembrance, and new beginnings. And we need to bring two things, an item which resembles what you remember most about a loved one who has passed, and an item which symbolizes a new beginning in your life. And the 10 a.m. morning group will be at the ocean on Columbus Manali, and the 7 p.m. evening group on the Lanai, Lanai, Presbyterian Church. Sunday, September 12th, all the flowers will come to Lanai's family, and our worship leader will be Rosemary Basilio, and there will also be a finance leader. Sunday, September 19th, is Council meeting, and Wednesday, September 22nd, Bible study, the fall Bible study group is beginning which is a uh, you'll get through this. The story of Joseph, Genesis chapters 37 to 47. 10 a.m. morning group here at Waterloo and CC, and 7 p.m. at the Lamar, at the Lamar Presbyterian Church. Sunday, September 26, at the top of the meeting, the class will meet. Are there any other announcements? table we remember the power of God and the power of love. It's at this table that we hear those rocks that crumble off of the mountains that God is moving. It's at, it's at this table that we realize that the armies had no power, that all of the power is here and it comes in the form of love and sacrifice in Jesus Christ. So today we celebrate and celebrate the bread in the cup, a reminder of God's incredible love and power in our world still today.
invitation. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. You who come to me shall not hunger. You who believe in me shall never thirst. In company with all who hunger for spiritual food, we come to this table to know that risen Christ and the sharing of his life giving bread. In Luke's Gospel, Jesus sat with two of the disciples who was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This table is for all believers who wish to know the presence of Christ and to share in the community of God's people. At the last meal of Jesus and his disciples, Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And he blessed him. He remembered today that, that he shared with the disciples that the bread represents his body, broken for our sins, broken for the world's sins, and that we are to take and eat of it each time that we gather. And in the same way, he took the cup. And he shared with the disciples that the cup represents his blood spilled out for the forgiveness of our sins. The new covenant made through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior in this world. And that we eat and drink of these as we gather together in remembrance of God, in remembrance of Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross and resurrection into the world. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for this bread and this, this cup of wine. To remind us of Jesus' incredible love, not just on that night and not just in those days, ancient days of long ago, but today, in our lives today, in our personal lives, the way that God's love floods our lives, the way that God's love goes ahead of us and clears walks that will cause us to stumble in our journey, the way that God's love goes ahead now, the way of Jesus and and moves those mountains, and moves those horns. So we gather your God just as the disciples did, ready to, ready to feast on your love and ready to be changed by this meal that we, meal that we will share together that leaves us forever bound with one another from generation to generation under the strength of your holy power and love, God. We offer you now the prayer that our Savior Jesus Christ taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
the scripture it says that if you say to the mountain, move from here to there, you will move, nothing will be possible for you. And this is because God will move that mountain. He's not saying move a physical mountain. He's actually calling us to move our hearts, our lives, from the depths of despair, grief, uncertainty, one of hope, love. And we share the song with you, how God will move that mountain.
as I can't even put it in words how beautiful that was. And Edwin and Dale, did they walk that song or what? And the dancers were so beautiful. Last Sunday with our youth. And did you see how many hands went into worship today? And feet and voices and all. So we thank everyone who was leading in our worship service today. Let's stand for the benediction. To the God who moves the mountains, to the God who stops those armies, to the God who has all of the power of heaven. Now leave with us as we go into the world. May we take whatever you've given us in this time together today, whatever specific word you've given us, may we take it. And may we, when we have that opportunity to share it, God, may we share it boldly. And the way that you would have us be your ambassador to not just your grace and your love and your mercy, but to your power that still wins here on earth. In all things, may we be your glory, God. In Jesus' name, we leave this place. Amen and amen and amen. Go in peace.